Hello and welcome to PFF Fantasy Football Podcast Team Preview Edition. I'm your host, Ian Hart. It's happy Thursday. Whenever the hell you're listening to this, I can't really keep up, but it's the NFC East. Washington Commanders, it's a great day to be great. And as always, I'm joined by none other than PFF's finest 17-time All-Star, Dwayne The Rock McFarlane. Dwayne, what's going on, man? 17 time. Is that is that because we have 17 game seasons now? Uh, anyway, um, yeah, man, I'm uh, feeling good. I mean, we're on we're on to Washington. The Commanders, no longer the football team, no longer the Redskins, the Commanders. Like, uh, I think I've got it. I think I've got it straight in my head. I think I'm going to be good on that. Dude, I get, I get thrown off, man, because as someone that has loved each of the AAF, XFL, and now the USFL, like, this name throws me off. I, I, get, I, I get in my zone of actually talking about Washington, and I think I'm in the USFL. Actually, Dwayne, like, that joke, I, that, that was a lie. I was trying to be funny. Maybe I did get a laugh. Maybe I didn't. But something that actually happened to me as I was writing this team preview was um, I was going from, started talking about the coaching staff and Ron Rivera, and I literally wrote about 300 words as if I was talking talking about the Panthers before like realizing that I need to be talking about Washington and this version of the Ron Rivera team. So that was embarrassing. Um, no one, well, in hey, my f- at least, at least it is not just Ron Rivera. It's Ron Rivera and Scott Turner. Yes. Both three years ago, we're together in Carolina and then now I've been together for two years and, and you know, Washington. So look, I, I think your brain was actually like kind of on the right wavelength still, even though you were still waking up. And it doesn't help matters that you could ask Ron Rivera about like his sandwich and he'd probably like try to comp it to something that happened to him in Carolina back in 2014. He even, um, he, he, I think he comped JD McKissick to Darren, maybe it was Jarrett Patterson to Darren Sproles at some point. And I was like, oh, okay, look at that, Ron. Like, good for you. You actually comped one of your running backs to someone other than Christian McCaffrey or Jonathan Stewart or D'Angelo Williams. And then I looked at his damn coaching history and realized that Ron Rivera coached Darren Sproles with the Chargers before he came to Carolina in the first place so got mad all over again at that but all <laughs> my stupid nonsense aside let's get looking at the washington commanders ahead of 2022 joint as always going to look first at some of the coaching staff changes if at all then some of the just kind of moves that have happened in free agency in the draft then we'll go quarterback running back wide receiver and tight end great day to be great as always c- continuity continuing to persist in Washington, at least for now. Ron Rivera, Scott Turner running the offense, and defensive coordinator Jack Del Rio, all back for the third consecutive season. We were talking briefly about this before the pod started joining. It's tough to kind of figure out exactly what Scott Turner wants to do in Washington. Obviously, their quarterback room for really the past two plus decades has been, you know, a revolving door, one guy after another. Particularly recently, it's been one guy after another. That just haven't been very good, you know, from Alex Smith to... RIP, Dwayne Haskins, like whatever you want to say, whoever they've had under center for the past few years, they have not been a good quarterback. Even the Alex Smith Smith year, man, like I was doing these solo pods before PFF hired you full-time, Dwayne, and I thank them every day for that because trying, trying to talk by yourself for 60 minutes is both sad and difficult to do because, you know, humans need to like swallow and shit like that. That doesn't sound good, but Dwayne, I remember like <laughs> trying to talk through some of these Washington games where Alex Smith, like him and Teddy Bridgewater would just play horrendous football and like media would be trying to make it out into something it wasn't because they're a great story and so here I was like sitting in the my room and alone at night and I'm like am I just like a terrible person for saying what I'm saying about Alex Smith but anyway Dwayne eighth in pass play rate in non-garbage time situations in 2020 they were 22nd in 2021 now we got Carson Wentz there who I do think is better than the Alex Smith than the Taylor Heineke's of the world and when you look at the Ron Rivera offense though he's used have more of a run first unit so between what we've seen from Turner from Turner Rivera and these last few years of the Washington Commanders offense how are you kind of expecting this scheme the trend pass versus run well they've been 60 40 and 64 36 you know pass to run over the last two seasons um, no sense in looking at Carolina that last year because that was Kyle Allen you know <laughs> so it's kind of like well just another year of uh, not having a quarterback so but like the the bigger picture is the fact that Ron Rivera does like to lean more into the run which we see a lot with former defensive coordinators that become head coaches right they kind of they don't necessarily manage the way plays get called but they they do kind of manage okay how how heavy of a pass team do we want to be? A lot of these coaches like this, they want to, they want their offensive game to live through efficiency. Think Pete Carroll, right? Not going <laughs> to throw the ball a lot, but you want to hit big plays. Ron Rivera is kind of the same mold. And when it works, like it's okay. Like in fact, the, the year that the Panthers went to the Super Bowl with Cam Newton, what did they have? They just kind of caught lightning in a bottle 
down the stretch that that year, and they had Ted Ginn going off for all these deep catches down the field with uh, you know Cam Newton throwing in the ball. So yeah, I think I think you're onto something with that. Like the way I've got them projected this year. Well, and real quick, just like their regulation plays per game, excluding overtime. So just kind of a different way to think about like the plays per game that you just talked about. Last year they were 14th, but only minus half a play per game versus the league average. The year before they were seventh, plus 2.3 versus the three-year um, NFL average. And then when you look at their splits and trail, close, and leading situations, this is really back to your point. I should have started with this, but anyway, my brain, our brains kind of get scrambled at times, Ian. But where I was going with the Ron Rivera comment, even when trailing by four or more points, they were minus 3% versus the league average and drop back rate, so intent to pass. In close situations, they were minus 2% versus the NFL average, and so that's within three points. And then when leading by four or more points, they threw, they dropped back to pass 5% less than the NFL average. So every single scenario, they're actually dropping back less, which makes me think you're going to keep it somewhere around like that 60-40 pass, right? You might you might say it ends up 62-38. If the season, if the season went really good for Washington right now, um, they are projected by under uh, by DraftKings Sportsbook to win seven and a half games. So, um, you know, we got 17 games in the season, so that number doesn't quite mean what it used to. Um, so, used to, you know, that would have been more like a six and well, more like six and three quarters. But anyway, like a team that's going to be close, right, to 500. I would feel comfortable, you know, projecting like if I was doing a range of outcomes on them, it would be from 58 percent passing to like 63 percent, right? Somewhere around there is the way I would look at them. You mentioned the history of Ron Rivera, specifically above average offense and total rush attempts in 10 of his 12 years as a head coach. Only two exceptions were 2019 and 2020 was when they actually ranked higher than 15th in pass attempts. Don't think it's a big coincidence that those were some of the years where his hands was forced by a bad Panthers team with Kyle Allen. And then in 2020, having to deal with just life with a quarterback under center who no one in the organization trusted if his leg could hold up. So what do you do? You get the ball out of his hands as quickly as possible. But with all of that aside, Hey, real uh, quick on Scott Turner, just uh, sorry. There are some really good things I like about Scott Turner. Um, He didn't have the quarterback play last year, but I think he's doing some things and and we'll talk about Carson Wentz in a moment, but I think he's doing some things that typically help quarterbacks. Number one, play action rate, 33.6% of the time. That was second in the NFL last year, right? So still trying to use play action to generate those yards after the catch, create those windows for the quarterback to throw through, throw to, making things easier, right? Trying to create yards um, for the quarterback. Trick look, so giving the defense something extra to think about right before the snap or post snap, 14.2% of the time. That was third in the NFL. And then shift in motion. 58.7%. That was seventh in the NFL. So these are things you actually see from Kyle Shanahan. They're things that you see from Sean McVay, um, where they really try to, like I said, amp things up for the quarterback, do as many things as they can for them to give them that advantage in reading the defense and creating space. And so I think those are positive. Like I didn't honestly coming into this, that was the biggest surprise for me with this team. Um was seeing those things and being like, wow, I didn't really, I didn't, for whatever reason, I didn't realize that Scott Turner may actually be a decently innovative mind as far as doing some things we've seen other coaches uh, really be successful with. Let's get on to some of the transactions that have transpired since last season ended. Biggest move, of course, Carson Wentz was acquired via trade between the Colts and the Commanders. With Wentz, who we'll talk about more specifically in the quarterback section, I just want to quickly point out, he's not this like league-worst quarterback, everyone. I understand he hasn't met expectations after that awesome 2017. You know, depending on who you want to listen to from the Colts' front office, like, not saying he's the best leader in the world. I don't really know, but the amount of people that are choosing to get upset by Carson Wentz's presence and seemingly, like, him as a person... There are truly so many worse people in the NFL for you guys to get mad about if you really want that to be kind of your just way you're going to view things. So Carson Wentz, if you're a Colts fan, if you're an Eagles fan, if you're just not a fan of the way that he's played over the past few years, I don't blame you. Just realize we're still we're talking about a top 20, top 25 probably quarterback on the planet. Last year, 18th in PFF passing grade, dropped down 28th in yards per attempt, 36th in adjusted completion rate, 16th in QB rating, and a Colts offense that... Let's face it. Yeah, it went through Jonathan Taylor. It wasn't like they were just wide open receivers running around behind him. I love Michael Pittman. We all love Michael Pittman. But old man T.Y. Hilton, Zach Paschal, you know, an injured version of Paris Campbell. There weren't that many places to go with the ball in Indianapolis. So I do think people are maybe putting a little too much stock into two instances last year. The Colts losing that final game to the Jaguars and that atrocious, like, 
57-yard performance against the Patriots. Uh, well, they managed to win anyway because of Jonathan Taylor. Like they, The Wentz lowlights are so bad that they just kind of cover up some of the good shit he does. Like that Titans game, he throws the left-handed like interception from his own end zone, and that's all we cared about, not the fact he like drove him down there for a touchdown the next drive to force overtime. So... There are some highlights. Like, there are a lot of quarterbacks that just suck all the time. Carson Wentz at least does flash the ability to be good. That's why all these teams sign up to give him a chance. Like, the NFL, you can say what you want about them not always making the perfect personnel move and stuff, but, you know, three different teams don't sign up to try to make Wentz the franchise quarterback by complete accident. Ryan Fitzpatrick. Yeah. Sorry, yeah, go ahead, Ryan. No, 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 go ahead. If we want to hit Wentz again, we can. But I was just, you pretty much hit everything there. All I was going to say is, like, it's to your point, like the ADP, it's all already baked in where he's going. I don't, he's an upgrade from Taylor Heineke. I just wouldn't go nuts about it is all I would say. You know, I mean, his, his completion percentage over his career is, you know, below the NFL average. You know, he's at 62%. Um, if you look at the league average, um, it's actually at 65%. If you look at his accuracy, that's the biggest thing for me. And it's been a problem for once for a while. He had one outlier year where it was really good. But if you look at his um, accuracy, so within the frame of the receiver, he was 27th out of 32 quarterbacks, with a higher number being bad. His catchable inaccurate passes, meaning, hey, the receiver could catch it, but like, it, you know, they had to basically make a maneuver to, to catch the ball. 27 of 32, and then uncatchable, meaning basically, you know, the receiver needed a step stool and they still couldn't get to it, um, or it was in the dirt, 26 of 32. And so, and these are some consistent things that we've seen um, over the last several years with Wentz. So I think the accuracy is the biggest issue. But again, like if Scott Turner can do some things, if you think back to Wentz's really good year, remember it was an efficiency season. It wasn't just because he dropped back and threw a lot of passes. Um, and that was the year he actually got hurt, right? Nick Foles came in and ended up going on, you know, uh, to the Super Bowl and handling that for him. But the way Wentz was winning early that season really was based around, you know, trying to give – not necessarily making him be hyper, hyper accurate and throw the ball a ton, but trying to give him big plays and trying to hit those big plays. Um, so we'll see what, what happens with Turner, but the accuracy is a concern. We'll talk more about Wentz. I can run through the rest of these pretty quick. Ryan Fitzpatrick, still a free agent, 2021 week one starter, took just 16 snaps before suffering that hip injury. Seems like that happened decades ago. Kyle Allen is now a backup with the Texans. Thank God he is no longer a career risk to Curtis Samuel. Uh, Garrett Gilbert remains a restricted free agent. Adam Humphreys remains an unrestricted free agent. Man, he was getting paid not that long ago. DeAndre Carter, complimentary receiver, signed with the Chargers. Low-key signing there. Don't think he'll make much noise, but who knows. And our old friend Andrew Erickson's doppelganger, wide receiver Alex Erickson, is now with the commander, seemingly taking the place of Carter as the backup receiver slash return assistant. Also lost backup tight end Ricky Seals-Jones to the Giants. We have Logan Thomas there and John Bates to potentially take up that time while Thomas misses maybe early season time coming back from that ACL injury. In the draft, Jahan Dotson with the number 16th overall pick figures to immediately slide into three wide receiver sets. Maybe a little bit of a reach. He was 56 overall on PFF's big board. Still someone that I think most had inside their top eight or so wide receivers before the draft. Took Brian Robinson in the third round. Bell Cow Pounder out of Alabama. Fifth round tight end Cole Turner could also factor into the offense. And of course, fifth round quarterback Sam Howell, someone that PFF far higher on than the NFL was apparently. And we will get now to how M. Wentz in this quarterback room. So, Dwayne, I hear what you're saying with Wentz. I do wonder how much of these three year totals are just like, my God, 2020. You cannot, there's nothing good to say about Carson Wentz. Like, that was so bad. He was even worse than he was as a rookie. Now, last year, it was just good to see Wentz get at least closer to the 2019 version of himself than the 2020. Because, again, I my eyes would bleed trying to watch that Philadelphia Eagles offense in 2020. I'm sure you caught a couple games with the Cowboys uh, playing them too, man. Just absolutely miserable. But, again, last year there were some good ones, man. Like Carson Wentz, he hasn't made $100 million playing football by complete accident. And the one real good hope I would – Try to get for Terry McLaurin because you're right, Dwayne. Fantasy wise, like we're not even chasing Wentz here. I think Wentz and Washington, we need to figure out if he's going to give it to us for Terry McLaurin and some of these pass catchers. Because for him, it's just, I don't even know what we're chasing at this point in fantasy. His honestly, like the reason why he hasn't been a complete train wreck over the past couple of years is because some of the rushing goodness he's been able to supply. That's something that I'm not exactly anticipating. Continuing on into Washington, though, and particularly as he continues to uh, get older, as we we talked about but 
He's an upgrade over, he- over Heineke. PFF passing grade and QB rating. Big time throw rate. Turn reward worthy play rate. Pick anything. Especially downfield, man. Out of 32 qualified quarterbacks, Heineke was by far the worst graded downfield passer last season. Wentz, to be fair, throws a nice deep ball. Dwayne, the question is, one, do you think Wentz is at all worth it as a late, late round quarterback? Not even late. I'm talking QB 20 or later against guys like Daniel Jones, Mac Jones, Matt Ryan, or you get all in on Wentz there. And then after that, what do you kind of think he can bring to the table? Maybe with that deep ball that Heineke couldn't. Yeah, I think it's all about with Wentz, you're correlating, right? You're If, if you've got other players from the commanders early on, maybe you've got McLaurin, maybe, maybe you have Dotson, maybe you took Logan Thomas. Maybe you have J.D. McKissick, right? And you're just trying to find ways late in a draft, you know, to let your QB2, QB3 have a correlation, right, back to that's other fair. players you have. Like that, that's the way I would really treat Wentz, especially with best ball, right? Um, I, you're not drafting him in a redraft yeah. unless you're in like a, you know, a 32-team league, right? Well, let's say like 20-team league might get you there with Carson Wentz. <laughs> but, um, yeah, I, I think the key is for McLaurin, can he unlock that deep ball greatness? You know, deep ball accuracy is something that's just not sticky year over year. However, I will give Wentz um, credit on that. Like, it's it's been pretty good. Um, it's been consistent. So here, are his, here are his deep passing grades for PFF. Um, so rookie season, 64.1 second year jumped to an 85 2. next year, 89, eight next year, 91, six. Then he took a big dip in 2020 with Philly that last year, 64.2, but back up to a 90.7, which kind of alludes to what you were pointing out earlier, you know, talking about his deep ball. So he actually, despite the fact that sometimes we discount deep ball accuracy when a quarterback shown it like over and over and over and over and their grade shows up, you know, as well each year, I think you kind of got to give it some merit. So I do think that is the area where he potentially helps McLaurin um, is, you know, can we not just win on the intermediate stuff with McLaurin? We know he can do that, but can he help on cork a few of the deep balls? I like to supply video in my articles. It's part of the game. I think if analytics don't show what we're seeing with our own eyes, it's probably not a very good analytic to be using. So with these quarterbacks, you know, we were joking around about how I literally could not put together 90 seconds of Tua's uh, big time throws from last year. Carson Wentz, man. We got, we got to 90. We even got 100 seconds of it. And I'll say, like, wasn't that much different than what Mac Jones was doing. We can talk about the low light reel and what that would look like. But again, Dwayne, it was just, it's interesting to me when I pump out Mac Jones highlights. Just And I don't even add anything to tweet. All I tweet is Mac Jones with the video. And it's, oh my God, look at, look at some of these throws. People think he's just this and that. And then it's like Carson Wentz and just every single reply is like, oh yeah, now show the low lights. And it's like, yeah, we <laughs> understand those are there. Doesn't mean we can't give a little bit of credit to Wentz sometimes when he does some good things. Man, as someone that watched the clown game, the Week 18 clown game, like Carson Wentz, it was 4th and 12 with like 8 minutes left. Season on the line. He gets a pressure in his face. Dude uncorks a beautiful 50-yard ball down the middle that hit Paris Campbell in the chest that he just couldn't hold on to. So... It's one of those things. It, it was weird, man. When Jonathan Taylor rushes for uh, 80 yards in a win, he's the best thing in the world. When he rushes for 77 yards with a season on the line in week 18, it was Carson Wentz's fault. So just the whole manner in which the Indy tenure has been kind of looking at in hindsight, I, I really think it's been a little bit unfair to Carson. But, you know, you guys can think what you think. Moral of the story, not really getting behind Carson Wentz. He is my QB 27 in fantasy land, but I'm at least feeling better about Heineke. Dwayne, I brought this play up against the Cowboys. Heineke rolls out. McLaurin gets open deep. Heineke says, no, go deeper. Waves him deep. Playmaker mode in Madden, Madden back in the day. Waves him further. Proceeds to crow hop into it and underthrows Terry by about 10 yards. And unfortunately, <laughs> even got Terry concussed when he ended up going up to try to get the ball. And that, and that really, as I was going back and watching Terry's film, was what kept happening. Like the tube would get so much separation only to then have it come back and be a contested catch. So good stuff on um, Wentz. What do you think the chances are, Dwayne, of Wentz starting 17 games are real quick? Do we really think there could be something there for Heineke or Sam Howell? I would think if Washington is playing really badly and they just want to give – I think they saw what they needed to see from Heineke last year. Well, yeah. Here's what I would say is if they are in winning mode, let's say they start off the season somehow 6-2 and two and Carson Wentz gets hurt, you're going to see Taylor Heineke, right? He's going to come in and be the bus driver. If they are two and six and Carson Wentz gets hurt, you may see Sam Howell, right? <laughs> so I so I think ultimately this is Wentz's year. I, I don't think he gets benched unless A, he gets hurt, or B, we're way late in the season 
and all of a sudden they are just they have a major losing record and they feel they've seen maybe enough from Howell in practice that they just want to throw him out there for a couple of games and see what they have. I, I don't think Heineke is a threat. I, I think Washington got to see enough of that last year. Don't even take our words for it. Look at the trade package they had to do to get Carson Wentz. Like, I think that tells us all we need to know about the Taylor Heineke experience. That tells us a lot of different things about Washington, period. <laughs> but hey, we'll leave it at that. Heineke, hey, man, credit to Heineke, though. Someone that didn't have a job in the NFL a couple of years ago. I think yeah. he's going to play a long-ass time as a backup. And that's the thing. Like, I was trying to get across with Wentz. I'm not even trying to put down Heineke. Heineke is probably a top 35, 40 quarterback on the planet. So, you know, we're just, Twitter's just going to say he sucks. But, uh, you know, Taylor Heineke, I'm looking forward to hopefully seeing that he has like a Chase Daniel-esque second half run of his career, just getting one paycheck after another. The real life Alex Moran, if you will. Let's talk some running back now. Antonio Gibson, J.D. McKissick, Brian Robinson, Jarrett Patterson. Yeah. What the hell, Dwayne? This offseason went so bad for Gibson. We were grinding the free agency blurbs together. You, me, Nathan Yonke. We saw J.D. McKissick sign with the Bills. Everyone got hyped. Then it didn't happen. He's back in Washington. Okay, fine. We got Antonio Gibson. He's been an upside RB2 the last two years. Maybe once gets some more out of the offense and he can flirt with the borderline RB1 finish. Not so fast, my friend. Third round running back, Brian Robinson, add to the equation. Ron Rivera has comped Antonio Gibson to Christian McCaffrey before. I think what he meant was, well, okay, we're not going to have him run as much as McCaffrey. We're also not going to have him catch as much as McCaffrey. But, you know, he's, so he's a completely different player than Christian McCaffrey was what Ron Rivera was trying to get across. Dwayne, I have Gibson RB28. That seems egregious. I think you have him somewhere similar. I just don't know what the best case scenario is, man. If these, if all three backs stay healthy, like what is Gibson going to give us? Because right now it looks like we're not going to get 40 or 50 receptions. And now even like 200 carries seem like a pipe dream. What the hell is going on here? Yeah. And Rivera did even mention before the draft that they were looking for a way to, to ease the early down workload on Antonio Gibson. Now, at the time, we saw McKissick leaving, and we were like, okay, who cares? Great. If they're going to have McKissick go, and now Gibson gets to take over the passing down work, it would make sense, you know, for a guy that's kind of been dinged up with shin injuries, toe injuries in both seasons, to have someone else there, right, to help carry some of that early down, you know, burden. And it would have been fine, because you're getting Gibson out there doing the thing we know he can do. Targets per route run, dude, Gibson 24% and 21% um, in 2020 and 2021, like, Really good mark. So, like, if you look at an average, uh, you know, running back targets per route run, you know, over the last se- three seasons in the NFL, um, you know, he's well above that. You know, just an average running back period, you know, comes out as a oh, targets per route, 18%, right? So he's well above that. But an RB1 is 20%, and he's been above that. So we know he can do it. But, again, the problem is J.D. McKissick. And last year, guess what? They did not trust Antonio Gibson in long down and distance or two-minute offense. So – if they're trailing and they got to speed up to catch up, McKissick's out there, Gibson's gone. The only time Gibson was getting to be in a route was typically on first and second down, or if it was like third and three, third and one, third and two, where, oh, we may hand it off to Gibson, but, oh, we could psych you out and like just throw it to him out of the backfield. So it's really problematic for Gibson because, you know, the beauty, what's held him together has really been the fact that over the last two years, he's had 60% of the team rushing attempts. And the year before, uh, which was only in 14 games, last year was 16 games, but the year before he had 45% of the team rushing attempts. He's not going to hit that number this year. There's just not, he's not going to hit that 60%. My guess is he'll be closer to 45, 50% of the team rushing attempts. And it could be worse than that. Because I think what you'll see is Robinson probably take 25 to 30%. You're going to see McKissick continue to take uh, the passing downs. And then to your your bigger point there, like where is the upside? How many players have to get hurt, right, for Gibson? So basically if you lose if you lose Robinson, you kind of get Gibson to be what he was last year, which was okay, but we weren't really that nuts about it, right, because McKissick was a blocker. I think the best path to Antonio Gibson all of a sudden having a season that outperforms ADP is if McKissick gets hurt. If McKissick gets hurt, like I don't think he needs two dominoes to fall. At that point, then I think he'll probably be 55, 60% of the rushing attempts, and he'll take, he should, he should. We can never be for sure on these things, but theoretically, like given his, given his skill set, like he should take over the two minute and long down distance stuff if that were to be the case. And in that, at that point, I think you would have, you know, you would have a really good fantasy player on your hands. I mean, we saw it last year. He played several oh, games baby. down the stretch. Now he got hurt. He hurt his toes, so we didn't get to see him like fully, fully unleashed. 
but he he did some damage last year down the stretch once McKissick went down. Six games with McKissick injured or completely out. PPR RB7, RB6, RB36, RB4, RB18, and RB6. This was huge. During the first 12 weeks of the season, when they were both in there, I mean, Gibson and McKissick each had two top 12 finishes. Gibson had six games in the top 24. McKissick had five. Like, total fantasy points. Gibson was at 148.5. McKissick was at 127.9. RB17 versus RB22. Like, they were really close. I, I think people understand that McKissick like is a highly used pass down back. Only Alvin Kamara has had more targets than McKissick over the past two seasons. That's how absurd it is. Why the hell is McKissick getting that many targets? He's good, but come on. Like that's just that's just insane. Like I'm not trying to put JD McKissick down, but he should not be in the same conversation with Alvin Kamara in terms of their pass game volume. But we saw them be willing, Dwayne, to go ahead and just give that to Gibson once McKissick was out. Gibson caught 23 passes in six games with McKissick injured. He had 19 catches in 10 games with McKissick in the lineup. So it was just one of these situations where they're choosing to put in McKissick. And I reject the idea this is because of pass protection. I think it's a lazy take. Um, What's Gibson weigh? An extra 30 pounds over McKissick. And if you look at the stats last year, McKissick never had a game where he passed block for more than six snaps. I mean, only twice the entire season he was in there did he have more than four pass pro snaps. Gibson was regularly staying in pass pro longer than J.D. McKissick was out there. It's more to do, like, no, you don't have J.D. McKissick on the field to pass block. You have him on the field to go run around and hopefully catch the ball, and then hopefully accounting for that same player in coverage that you would have liked to have him pass block in the first place. So, you know, we can uh, dig up their... I'm not saying McKissick isn't a better pass pro guy than Gibson. He very well might be, but it's not this massive difference in something that is just completely keeping Gibson off the field. I will say this, though, Dwayne, as someone that has in the past truly believed in, I think we saw it at the end of last year, like Gibson can be an upside RB1 with enough opportunity, but it's a statement that I do think applies to basically any running back that has shown the ability to catch passes. Gibson was terrible as a rusher last year, and we don't really hold this against every running back. We do against Saquon Barkley, but God forbid we mentioned how DeAndre Swift or Antonio Gibson wasn't very good. PFF rushing grade. Gibson was 44th among 50 running backs with at least 100 carries last year at 65.6. Average just four yards per carry. That ranked 36. 2.8 yards after contact per carry. That was 27th. Just 0.15 missed tackles for us per carry. That was tied for 31st. Right now, Dwayne, I'm taking guys like Clyde edwards alaire Cordero Patterson, and Chase Edmonds ahead of Gibson. They all have lower ADPs. And honestly, like, he's going in the fifth round right now. I would much rather take stabs on, like, Cortland Sutton, Gabriel Davis, and Allen Robinson. Maybe if Gibson, because, like, we did our draft uh, yesterday. People can find that on YouTube, podcast, wherever the hell you're listening to us now. If Gibson falls to round seven or eight or something with the rest of these running backs, that's okay. But I have the same kind of concerns with Gibson as I do with other running backs going multiple rounds later. And because of that, I don't see myself getting hardly any exposure to him. Yeah, I think if he slips, I'll definitely gain some exposure just because the NFL season can be wild. But to your point, like, what are we betting on with Gibson? We can't necessarily say it's talent, and we just we certainly just freaking covered situation, right? Yes. I mean, so beyond just the rushing grade, and, and look, to give him some credit, like the guy was a receiver three years ago. And he was playing hurt throughout the entire, entire last season. He was, really, he was much yeah. better as a rusher his rookie year. Yes. Yeah, and so, I mean, but he was still under the league average in a lot of ways, even as a rookie. So, I mean, you know, you, you hit all the main stuff, but missed tackles force per attempt, that's minus 2% versus just the NFL average. You know, if you look at his explosive play rate, it's minus one and a half percent versus the NFL and one and a half percentage points um, versus the NFL average. And then yards after contact, he is also below the NFL average. Now, to your point, like there was the injury. So you kind of got to look at the year before and take that into account. But like how how great of a player do we really think Gibson is at this point? I mean, look, he's a former third round pick, 66 uh, pick, 66 overall that now has a pick. You know, another former, uh, another third rounder joining him in the backfield. Um, I just, man, I, I feel like folks are stretching to continue to want to love on Gibson. Yeah. And, and overall, ADP's adjusted. Like, to see him drop from where he was in the third round to the fifth, but I'm with you. I think he needs to fall more into the range of, like, that round seven, round eight. I don't know if he will just because people still see him as being this guy that has that the, that passing down skill set, and he does, but... Look, folks, it's going to take an injury. Washington did not bring back J.D. McKissick and talk him out of a deal with Buffalo just because they're not going to use him. Oh, by the way, he's been really freaking good as a receiver. And as much as we love Gibson, 
Um, I mean, you could argue J.D. McKissick is still a better player as far as being, you know, on his targets per route, he's better. On his yards per route run, he's better, you know, than Gibson. We, we like Gibson, but McKissick is a special mismatch weapon against linebackers and safeties. We both, I think you and I both agree, we think Gibson could be that too. But why do you bring McKissick back if you're not going to use him in that role? Which begs the question, do we want some McKissick? Last year, before he got hurt, PPR RB22 in that stretch, Dwayne. I know it's full PPR only on, you know, even half point sites like Underdog. I think you can probably, you know, scratch them off unless you want to go late, late, late. I guess the problem is we have we don't we've never had a chance of McKissick just getting that massive role. And Gibson got hurt last year, you know, who stepped in the early downs. It was Jarrett Patterson. Obviously, it's gonna be Brian Robinson this year. With McKissick and Robinson both going like awfully late in drafts, would you rather take Robinson just for that better kind of best case scenario? Yes. Because, okay, yeah. And when we talked about these running backs before the draft, Dwayne, Brian Robinson was someone to me that even though he was kind of being typecast as this early down grinder, from what we saw with him with pass protection, and I think he caught like 35 or 38 targets. Yep. I don't think he's even Gibson good as a receiver, but I don't think he's someone that they just need to yank off the field every time they want to throw the ball. We're not talking about Rojo here. Yeah, exactly. I would rather take Robinson. Now, I think it depends on your roster construction. Like, like let's say you didn't take uh, any running backs early, and so you in round eight or nine started pounding a lot of the guys you just talked about. You used to, or say round seven, you were like, okay, I'm going to take Miles Sanders, Kareem Hunt, uh, Chase Edmonds. Let's say you walk away with those three, and you're just, okay, man, I hope I can scrape together a RB1, RB2 out of those, especially in best ball. Like, um, between those and let's say maybe you tack on a rojo or somebody like that and now you're wanting to add one more running back to your roster like if that's how you built your roster i might take mckissick because then i'm just looking like who could give me a floor that i know they're going to be involved in a ppr format i would not touch him in standard but maybe on the weeks that all these upside guys i have none of them come through for me maybe i want to have a mckissick right because there's a chance that brian robinson is a zero his upside case is higher. We were just on a call earlier, right, with all of our team talking about how do you really grade upside ceiling, right, versus floor. And so these are the kind of conversations you have to have. Robinson's ceiling is higher than McKissick. McKissick's floor is higher. And to your point, McKissick, no matter how many dominoes fall his way, they're never going to give him a huge work uh, rush load in, in the work and uh, a huge workload in the <laughs> rushing department. Like listen to his career numbers: eleven percent, twenty-two percent, ten percent, thirteen percent. Like he. he He's not going to get it. Like the most you would hope for is like a 15 to 20 percenter. And you, honestly, you don't want J.D. McKissick carrying the ball, you know, 30, 40 percent of the time, you know, with the size player. He, he really is built like a receiver. Like he's built like a slot yeah. receiver. Um, so, yeah, I think it depends on what you're looking for. I think you could make an argument for McKissick. You could make an argument for Robinson. But if you're going for the upside of the role, I think Robinson's definitely the pick. Before we get on some wide receiver goodness, I want to give a quick shout out to our sponsor today. Podcast is sponsored and brought to you by FanDraft. Are you holding an in-person fantasy draft party this year? My favorite types. Then you need to check out FanDraft.com. FanDraft is a modern, digitalized version of those old sticker boards we used, used to use at our drafts. I actually still do order one of these a year for my uh, lovely eight-man league with a bunch of my idiot college friends. Uh, love you guys. However, unlike those outdated sticker boards, FanDraft makes your fantasy draft feel like the actual NFL draft with features such as custom logos, draft clock, team walk-up songs, a streaming news ticker, and much more. Can't overstate how much you need music at your draft party. And yeah, you know, we can get into uh, whatever type of music you like. Country, rap, I don't give a shit. Whatever you're feeling later, that's fine. But at least for the first round or two, I need NFL primetime music blasting wherever I am. I don't care how many weird looks I get from strangers, and I appreciate FanDraft taking a similar mindset to the drafting experience. And the best part is, FanDraft works by running your league's draft from the fandraft.com website and then exporting your display onto a larger TV screen for the league to enjoy. So this can be used fully online and any number of your league owners can join the draft remotely. So you don't need to worry about someone forgetting the sticker board, lugging that damn thing around. You can just go to fandraft.com, sign up for a free trial. And when you're ready to order the pro account, make sure to use the promo code PFF to save 15% off your purchase. That's fandraft.com with code PFF. Get you 15% off. Another nice little deal for our lovely listeners. 
Underdog Fantasy, Dwayne and I drafted there last night. You should draft there soon because it's Best Ball Summer, baby. Best Ball Mania Tournament has $10 million in total prize money, and you just draft your team. That's it. No waivers, no trades, none of that. You just draft and then hopefully collect your money when the season is over. And Underdog is going to double your first deposit up to $100 when you sign up with the promo code PFF. And if you play just 10 of those dollars using promo code PFF, you get a free PFF subscription. So what are you waiting for? Head to underdogfantasy.com or the App Store. Play $10 with code PFF and draft your best ball mania team today love the sponsors Dwayne very cool fan draft idea I appreciate uh, them taking something and you know making it digital making it modern great day to be great let's talk some wide receivers we got Terry McLaurin Jahan Dotson Curtis Samuel Diami Brown Cam Sims seemingly the big five there in Washington how high is too high for Terry McLaurin? I went into this article, Dwayne, looking at him. He's my wide receiver, 13. I thought I might have him outside my top 20 when I was done. I am done, and he is now my wide receiver, 14. So I'm in. I'm in on Terry McLaurin. I think my one my one caveat with him is that I have him ranked wide receiver, 13, but I might just lower that purely because he's only priced as the wide receiver, 22, over underdog right now. And we've talked about the idea of, you know, don't draft someone in round three when you can get them in round four. So I'm not going to fall into that trap because I'm not, you know, I do like to think I know what I'm talking about here, Dwayne, but I'm not confident enough in McLaurin over a bunch of wide receivers in the same tier to forfeit that just obvious value and chance to get both of them. So I guess the question here, Dwayne, is, and as you're going to show and share your handy-dandy wide receiver tiers that everyone can find on pff.com, had that published soon, like, why do we have Terry McLaurin behind a bunch of guys that could just be in similar to worse situations? Because I think we all agree that the first 10, 11, maybe even 12 wide receivers, we got talent and situations that are going to feed them the ball. But once we start getting to the Terry McLaurin's, DJ Moore's, Deontay's, DK Metcalf, I'm not calling you guys crazy if you think you should be taking some of them ahead of McLaurin, but I think Terry is every bit as good as them and the target ceiling is as high as anyone. Yeah, so I, you know, when I look at Terry, I have him in the same tier as Deontay Johnson, DJ Moore, DK Metcalf, because I, I, I'm not as big of a believer, you know, and not saying you're a huge believer in Wentz either, right? But I'm using market sentiment right now, QB 28 <laughs> on Wentz, yeah. projected team wins. It's just, it's the team environment, right, that's holding all of these guys down. But to your point, and, and real quick, like, if, if you're looking at the talent profile for Deontay Johnson, DJ Moore, DK Metcalf, Terry McLaurin, they're all good. So if you like to yeah. bet on talent and you're the per, you're the type of drafter that likes to give double double birds to situations, <laughs> this is your tier. No, it doesn't matter. You can just take all these guys. You not care about it. But for me, in the new model, you know, I'm really trying to do a better job of factoring in all the different things, Ian, that you and I talk about pretty much every week. And like, how do we get all that in, in here? Now, having said that, um, I have already in my mind toyed with moving Terry McLaurin to the top of the tier because I think I do have to at least give the head nod to uh, Carson Wentz, even though, you know, his QB ADP is at 28 versus Mitchell Trubisky at 30. They're not very far away. I still think I probably need to give Terry McLaurin uh, the slight, you know, nod because they're also close anyway in talent, to your point. Yeah. I would say I don't, I don't disagree with what you're saying because if I were to move Terry McLaurin up a tier – he would not go into the tier above at 2B, right? Those, no. that's, I call that the boomer tier. I can say boomer because <laughs> you call me a boomer all the time. They are boomers in wide receiver years. Mike Evans, 29-1, Keenan Allen, 30.4. And guess what? They're both declining across the board. Targets per route run, yards per route run, every metric, they're declining. Doesn't mean they can't be good this year, but that he wouldn't fit there, right? The next tier where he would fit would be 2A, which is where you would put him with... T. Higgins, A.J. Brown, Michael Pittman, and Jalen Waddell. And the only reason I didn't move him there, and I think I'm just going to put him at the top of Tier 2C, is because when we look at this situation over here, like, you know, the team quality and the QBs are still just slightly worse, right, than what we have yeah. up here. But I think you could make an argument. Where did you say he ended up for you? 14. 14. Like, if I was re-tiering him, like, he, you know, he would go to 13 for me. So I think we're actually really close on him. I'm going to leave him in the tier I have him in. Honestly, I haven't toyed around like this. He just kind of have like his own tier because it is just slightly better than these other guys, but I don't want to make things, you know, overly complex, but I'm definitely going to move him to 15. This is where I love our PFF grades is for someone like Terry McLaurin because remember, like they're getting between they're getting a, a negative if they're they're messing up, but their positive isn't necessarily based on them just, you know, 
they can have a positive play by not recording a catch. So sometimes efficiency metrics for yards and even targets don't tell the whole story. So when I see Terry McLaurin, 25th in yards per route run, 35th in yards per reception since entering the league, but tied for 13th in PFF receiving grade. And then we start watching the film and oh my God, Dwayne, Oh, it's so good. And like Chad Johnson is like the bit, one of the biggest Terry McLaurin guys out there. And you see why. I mean, my God, one play after another. There's nothing he can't do. He gets separation off the line. And I know all these guys we're talking about are great and they're awesome wide receivers. But just going through what Terry was able to do and just seeing the passes consistently come late. I, I, I messaged you this yesterday like at 9 p.m., Dwayne, because when we were having that big, you know, week of the offseason where everyone's talking about how, you know, Drake London and contested catches and you know, what is separation and what is it not. The play Terry McLaurin had against the Falcons, where he literally, he Gabe Davis level shakes this cornerback, like fakes outside, comes back in, puts him in the dirt, is standing wide open in the end zone. And to be fair, I think Heineke was under some pressure, so I'm not completely throwing him under the bus, but he's all alone in the end zone for a good two seconds. Cornerback comes back, makes a contested catch situation. Terry like jumps over him and makes the catch anyway. So it was just, again, the epitome, in my opinion, of what McLaurin has had to go through. Since getting into Washington, he has caught passes from Alex Smith, Ryan Fitzpatrick, Dwayne Haskins, Colt McCoy, Case Keenum, Kyle Allen, Taylor Heineke, if your ears aren't bleeding yet, Garrett Gilbert as well. Carson Wentz is objectively the best one of that group, and I am buying Terry McLaurin inside that tier. Wide receiver 13, wide receiver 14. And we can get him much cheaper than that, Dwayne. I mean, for Terry to be kind of the odd man out right now on underdog is surprising to me. He, he set up he set up brilliantly, man. Terry McLaurin 2022. Let's go. Yeah, yeah. I, and look, this year, we're going to have, like, we've already talked about it. We're going to have, like, an emergency receiver pod at some yeah. point. Because <laughs> the other thing is you got to start looking below, right, in these other tiers. And, I mean, there's a lot of questions. Um, and so... I think getting more comfortable with a player like McLaurin, like we need, we need some more people to really be comfortable with at receiver because there are a boatload of questions. Like as you continue on, let's talk about Jahan Dotson a little bit. 16th overall pick of the 2022 NFL draft PFF's 2022 draft guide said the following about Dotson. This is mostly from Mike Renner and you can always find the 2022 draft guide on PFF.com. Where he wins with his suddenness, Dotson not only wins with his ability to cut on dimes, but also by hauling in everything thrown his way. That kind of combination will earn a quarterback's trust early on in his career. What's his role? Reliable slot. Dotson is really tailor-made to play slot in today's NFL. He's as shifty as it gets with enough speed to challenge vertically, but more importantly, he has a massive catch radius for a player listed at only 5'11". Where he can improve muscle mass, Dawson could stand to add muscle to his frame and develop a more diverse release package. Being able to dictate terms at the line would take his game to the next level. Dwayne, last year, the Panthers gave Curtis Samuel $34.5 million over three years. Unfortunately, he suffered a groin injury in June. Just never got right. It was never in a situation to be out there for even half of the snaps during any given game. With Dotson, I was I was really high on Curtis Samuel before. Had him like wide receiver 50, 51 going this year. Now I have Dotson ranked there. Curtis down at wide receiver 77. I'm cool with taking a chance on Dotson because like people I think are just, they're putting him well behind all the wide receivers we had ranked ahead of him before the draft while just ignoring the fact that an NFL team told us they think he's the 16th best player in the entire draft. Dotson seems pretty safe in the slot. My other question for you is, is Curtis just completely out of the picture here? I love the money, but they also did use a third round pick in Diami Brown last year. And to me, this looks like a situation where I know Terry's not losing any of his routes. You just drafted Dotson in the first round. He's going to be out there. Maybe we see Samuel and Brown just unfortunately splitting things very much similar to what we see in uh, the, with the Chargers and Jalen Guyton and Josh Palmer kind of splitting their reps as number three. Yeah, well, the one thing that's positive is 11 personnel is heavily used by Washington. So okay. I, I think there's going to be a great opportunity to have three receivers on the field. And I think Curtis Samuel will still be one of those three if he's healthy. Diami Brown would be the competition to watch out for, um, depending on what they want to do. And maybe those two guys rotate a little, right? Curtis is uh, Curtis can do it all. That's the thing. I, I don't want to forget like what we saw from Curtis Samuel because he's still a young player. And last year, man, his growing was hurt the whole season. He hurt it in preseason. So he was never able to get over it. Um, and, and so it's hard to grade anything about last season with Curtis Samuel. I think you have to basically throw it out. Now, the addition of Dotson, I agree with you. Um, like, I, I want to be above consensus on the market on Dotson. 
Um, and right now I have our, if folks want to see this, they can go back and look at our uh, draft pick coverage. Like, so it's in the rookie uh, wide receiver rankings ahead of the draft. This information is also um, inside our draft uh, tracker that we did, as well as the rankings that you and I and Nathan uh, Yankee did together post-draft, where we put all of our ranks together to have like a consensus rank. So all this information, if you are on YouTube and you like it, if you're not, if you're listening to a podcast, you've got um, the draft capital, uh, the rookie age, their career dominator, their best dominator, all the cool stuff everybody loves to talk about, you know, all in one place. And you're kind of looking at the profile. So with Dotson, once he got the draft capital, man, I mean, if you look at his best dominator season, of, so and dominator being, you know, the yardage share um, and touchdown share that he had in his best season for uh, his college team, 43%. He did that at 20 and a half years old. Like that rivals like, you know, the best people on this on this board. Now, to your point, he was more of a slot guy, which I think could push, you know, Samuel outside. His career yards per route run and his uh, explosive targets per target, which is, you know, uh, 15 yards or more per target, were lower than the rest of the class. So he's really good as far as demanding targets, not as good as the others when it when you look at his career yards per route run and his explosive rate. But having said all that, like now just looking at where he sits in the ranks, I have him as a 5A, so a wide receiver 5, really with upside. That's what the A's typically are in my ranking system. And so whenever you look at him, um, like he's going behind, you know, he's going right now ADP of FFPC, thanks Fantasy Mojo, of 58, underdog going 63. So I, I get it. His profile wasn't quite as good as some of the other guys, but, man, that's just that's a disconnect, right? That's a market yeah. opportunity. Right now Christian Watson is going 52. Um, whenever we look at Chris Olave going 45, Sky Moore going 41. So, I mean, for like, I feel like you're going to have to have some hubris, right? The NFL draft capital says a lot. It's only a portion of what we use and the way that we grade, you know, what we project these players for. But at the end of the day, like, it's still a big determinant. So I, I think just being able to get your hands on Dotson as late as you can get him compared to where you have to take the other receivers. I mean, and doesn't mean you can't, it doesn't preclude you from taking some of the other rookie receivers. He's just something that's similar, right? He's an arbitrage play. Jahan Dotson is an arbitrage play on someone like Christian Watson. So I really love getting him at his ADP. I have him at 54, which is ahead of the ADP for FFPC or underdog. I have him 52, so we are very much on the same page. That last Excel you had up, I think, tells you all you need to know where the first 12 wide receivers picked, 11 of them have a quarterback going 19th or worse in ADP right now. Like Dotson's situation mm -hmm. under center isn't any worse than basically any other wide receiver picked in the first two rounds, save for Christian Watson and Sky Moore, who, yeah, I understand if you want to put them ahead of him, but I think that, you know, just, again, the disparity is too big for a player that it's not like people were out on Dotson before the draft. They're surprised he went in the first round, but, you know, I don't think we need to penalize the guy for surprisingly so going in the first round. That. It should be a huge positive. I yeah. was thinking about the same thing. Remember, before the draft, he was getting mocked consistent, consistently to the Packers, to the Chiefs. We were even some, seeing some to the Bills, and people were just bananas about it. Now he gets <laughs> even better draft capital, and to your point, actually has a better QB ADP than the rest of the guys, you know, or I mean, it's right around where the rest of the guys are above him. And he basically went, you know, I mean, he went pick 16. Drake London was 8. Garrett Wilson was 10. Alave was 11. Jamison was 12. And, and I get it. The commanders, uh, apparently, what they were looking to do was still get Drake London. Uh, or they wanted Drake London, and they didn't, and that's why they traded back. And then, so people then immediately, right, the narrative becomes, oh, they settled for dots. And you're not settling for him if you're still taking him at pick 16. Settling means, ah, let's trade back again, like to, to like the late, you know, 20s, you know, early 30s. That, that would be okay settling. But they still went ahead and made their pick at pick 16 with him. So I'm, I'm with you, and I think it's a great call out. Like looking at the QB ADPs, like <laughs> what's really different, you know, for him versus these other guys. Um, and again, like Terry McLaurin's really the only other guy on the team where we feel really strongly about his role. There's other guys we like, but Terry we know is going to do his thing. But outside of that, there's room for someone else to step up. And why not? Why, why wouldn't it be Jahan Dotson, a first round pick? especially room given kind of the state of this tight end room at the moment. Mentioned how last year backup rookie Seals Jones, now a member of the New York football giants. We don't really know when Logan Thomas is going to be back. He underwent ACL surgery in mid-December. Uh, most 
recently was reported to be quote unquote ahead of schedule on April 23rd after being cleared to start jogging four months removed from surgery. But man, you get that December ACL tear. We talked about this a lot with the wide receivers, let alone a tight end that's, you know, over 30 years of age at this point. It does seem like starting the season in October, maybe even November is on the table. If Logan Thomas is going to be out of the picture, it will be John Bates there. Is John Bates going to play 60% snaps? No. 70? Nope. 80? 90? 100 percent snaps probably for John Bates and this is like this just makes the entire Alex, I'll back take room. Uh, 100 I'll give, give me 100 for the daily double this <laughs> makes the John running Bates. back the fact that Rivera and the Washington coaching staff refuses to feature a running back but will play literally any tight end Logan Thomas John Bates and Ricky Seals Jones all had games where they did not leave the field for a single snap last year like Ricky Seals Jones is a freaking former converted wide receiver and he was not leaving the field Logan Thomas used to be a quarterback and these are the guys that are playing every single snap but you know your former wide receiver uh, whatever with this in mind though Dwayne Logan Thomas if he was purely healthy that'd be fine but when I look at it right now Evan Ingram, Cole Komet, I think they have similar upside, similar roles, and they're not coming off an ACL injury. So for me, with Logan Thomas, he's just not someone I want to take right now while he's not healthy. And with John Bates, like we saw him have this chance last year and nothing amounted to it. I don't think we need to worry about the Washington tight ends. Yeah, and in the end, for Logan Thomas, it's always just been the volume. Like his yards per route run, 0. 0.84, 0.63, 1.06, 1.10, 1.30. 1. Targets per route run, 11%, 13%, 17%, 17%, 17%, 17%. The thing that has carried him has been the number of routes he gets to run. Uh, in 2020, when he had the breakout season, he was in a route on 91% of Washington's pass plays. And so, yeah, it, look, he's not. he did get paid. He did get his money. So not saying he wouldn't be part of the offense, right, if he's there and he's healthy. But he's not a guy that I feel like you really have to go out of your way for. Last year, you and I liked him. We kind of thought he was like that last guy break, you know, you know, break glass in a case of emergency. Like, hey, Logan Thomas might be the last guy at the cutoff. You know, you yeah. at least know he's going to be out there running a lot of routes. Um, so if we were to heal, hear that he's really healthy, we may start to feel more like that about him. Absolutely. You know, again. Yeah. But at the same time, I don't think he needs to be inside the top 12, really, no matter what. Um, I think he's to, he needs to be outside the top 12, even if we get glowing um, you know, reviews about where he is from a health perspective in training camp. One quick note I will give is you know, he, let, he played the first three games, and he was out there for routes of 93%, 92%, 97%. Then when he came back in week 12 and 13, and then he got hurt again, when he came back in those weeks, it was only 68% and 62% of the route. So this is a player that went on to IR. They knew he was good to go. And when they brought him back, what did they do? When they had he and John Bates together, it's a small sample size, people, but we uncover, we try to uncover everything for you. It really was more of a split, right? He was more, and 70% is not bad. 70% of the routes is okay, but we want to be at 80% or above. And he was always a slam dunk to do that before. Now it might be a little more iffy if they have him and Bates together. Cole Turner, fifth round, maybe a little piece of it too. I mean, John Bates wasn't this highly drafted guy and he was enough to fit in there. So with these other guys, yeah, it's just more so what will they be taking away from the starter? And in Bates' case, reason enough to believe that. I think Logan Thomas, he could rise up the ranks if we get good news on his health. Like he did get that three-year, $24 million extension you mentioned. That's hardly insignificant money. So if we get good news, we'll move him up the ranks right now. I'm skeptical he can, he's able to start the season. And in that case, like I'm sure we'll be here week four, Dwayne, talking about how he's one of the best uh, waiver wire additions you can get because of that volume that's so hard to find elsewhere at the position. So we love Terry McLaurin. We love Jahan Dotson. We're out on the running backs. Pretty much out on Carson Wentz, but think he's a you know better real life quarterback than some of you folks are giving him credit for. And then at tight end, pausing on it, Logan Thomas. Once he is healthy, we can give another nice look. But even then, even if he was completely healthy, yes, yeah, someone that I think we'd struggle to even rank top fifteen, top sixteen. Sound about right, Twin? Yep. Yeah, and, and the only thing I would add on Wentz is like what we said earlier. Don't be in best ball. Fine is a correlation play. Right. Yeah. Let's say you landed McLaurin, you know, or, or Dotson or for some reason you end up with both. Like if you end up with both, like you just need to go ahead and put a chip down on Washington's offense. Right. Um, and go ahead and take Carson Wentz. So that, that would be the way to think about it is he's a nice correlating play. Um, and the other way to think about correlations would be who if you do that, like say you've got um, Carson Wentz and then you've also got McLaurin. Like who is Washington playing? 
late in the season, yeah. right? In those big time money weeks in your best ball leagues, then you could think about that as well. And that's kind of what we were doing on the stream because we got Kyler really early. So obviously when you get Kyler, you don't need to invest that heavily in your second quarterback. And I think we had Ryan Tannehill was available, who we each had both. We both had ranked higher than some of the other quarterbacks, but we actually wanted Goff because we had Jamison. <laughs> and, and he went. Someone. How does Goff go ahead of Tannehill ever except the one draft where we're actually going to take him ahead of Tannehill? When you're doing a fantasy draft and you're mad about getting sniped on Jared Goff, you got to kind of take that extended look in the mirror sometimes and wonder exactly what decisions you made to get to this. I went through the whole process of getting Ian's head around Jared Goff without him (laughs) screaming at me. And and then he goes like two picks in front of us. Oh man, that was fun though. Appreciate you guys that tuned into that. All right, Dwayne, great stuff. This is going to wrap up this edition of the PFF Fantasy Football Podcast. We will be back with the New York Football Giants next. Thank you as always for tuning in. For Dwayne, I'm Ian. Thanks again for tuning in. Until next time, take care, everybody.